So it is 2 p.m. We can yes. start the presentation. So hi, everyone. Uh, I think more people will come during the talk, but we can start. So today we have the final webinar in this season. And uh, Pierre Pinson will present on making decisions when you do not trust your forecasts. But we'll move to his presentation in a moment. Uh, I want to make a brief introduction of the Center for Marketing Analytics and Forecasting, just say a couple of words about us. So this slide shows who we are. Uh, we have currently 12 uh, members of the center. And among those, I wanted actually to, um, to, to, to spotlight uh, Kandreka because Kandreka has been the organizer of uh, these webinars the whole season and he's, he has taken over this responsibility. And these webinars wouldn't happen without him. So. I just wanted to say thanks a lot, uh, Kandrika, for doing all the hard work. We also have uh, PhD students, and we don't have everyone here. Uh, well, we don't have PhD students on this slide. And one of those is uh, Ritika Aurora. She's been helping with webinars as well, and I wanted to mention her as well. Uh, as for the center, you can see what we, services we provide. We have bespoke short courses, and executive training, things like that, consultancy, and so on. Uh, and we work with companies and we have expertise in a variety of topics. I would say that marketing analytics, which is the first one here, is pr probably should be the last one because uh, we are more focused on demand forecasting, inventory management, SNOP, and so on and so forth. Um, we have a variety of things happening. Uh, we have these webinars, we are working on educational videos and we want to resume the in-person workshops in London at some point, but this is not decided yet. And you can be in touch with us and what we, with what we do on Twitter, on LinkedIn. You actually, if you scan this QR code, you will see the page that has uh, all the links to all the important resources. We have, for example, our YouTube channel where we upload recordings of the uh, webinars and we upload our educational videos as well. Uh, yeah, that's it from me. So over to you, Pierre. You can start sharing your screen and start the presentation. Ah, while you're doing that, I will also make a short announcement that um, for the for the participants, if you want to ask questions, you can type them in chat or using Q and A functionality of Teams, and we will ask these questions <coughs> to Pierre at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Well, th thanks very much, Ivan, for uh, for the introduction. Um, so I, I, I wanted to talk about something we um, we don't cover enough, right? We love to do forecasting, and we develop new methods. We look at new data. We are looking at new approaches to verification. Um, but often we don't have such a strong linkage with making decisions. I think it's more and more, um, but but still, I think we need to integrate uh, that better. And so I, I could see enter, for instance, that is online. You know, I think as you as you connect um, forecasting and decision making, you start discovering some new dimensions in terms of, let's say, forecast quality uh, that we tend to overlook if we don't connect to the decision making. So enter that I mentioned with online, it looks at uh, sta stability. And I think uh, we have colleagues who will call it uh, congruence. Um, but here I want to talk about trust. If we have to make decisions based on forecast and we don't trust our forecast, I think we expect uh, humans to, uh, um, you know, use their expert knowledge to have some kind of adjustment somehow automatically yeah, uh, based on gut feeling. Uh, but we can do that also in a much more data driven manner by understanding better what the problem is about and how we can account for this um, problem of not trusting the forecast. So I want to, to go to that. Um, and as I said, the thing is that Often we see a lot of forecasting work being done in academia where there's no connection to a true decision making problem. You know, it's mentioned in the introduction, there's going to be someone making decision, but it's not my problem, right? I will uh, provide the forecast. What I think in industry or in different parts of academia, there are people who say, no, actually, if you don't understand what the decision making is about, uh, how can you really produce uh, some nice forecast as input to this decision making? So that's always been my philosophy that I, I want to do both. Good. So today I want to use uh, renewable energy and uh, market trading 
as an example. You will understand why, because it's a very simple example that's very similar to what you would do uh, with inventory management. Um, and then we'll go through different situations. So you have situation of having no forecast. And why do I do that? I will explain is that, uh, you know, if you don't trust your forecast, some of the asymptotic case would be that you consider it as if I had no forecast. So we need to start with that. Uh, then there would be the case of deterministic forecast, which we will skip in the interest of time. And then we'll go directly to the more general case of uh, probabilistic forecast. So please remember, there are forecasts everywhere, but we are not sure we want to trust the forecast we've been given. All right, so renewables in electricity markets, um, that would be the setup. It's a quite um, simple setup, I would say. Uh, you have this timeline where you make forecasts at time t and you look at time t plus k in the future, right? So k is the, is the lead time. I'm trying to use different colors consistently throughout the talk. So in green, uh, that would be some kind of input parameters, right? So uh, you could say it's uh, you can control them or, you know, you, as the user, you can uh, just plug them into your problem. In blue, you have the random variables or anything that relates to random variables. And in red, it's your decision. So here, when you have a renewable energy producers that go in electricity market, the same way you would want to uh, purchase for your inventory, um, at time t, you need to make a decision for time t plus k. You have a random variable. For me here, it's renewable energy production. It is omega t plus k. Um, it could be your demand, right? If you were to think of inventory management. And my decision YK is how much I'm going to bid in the market. So I'm offering, you know, how much I'm going to be able to produce, but I have to do it in advance. So I'm going to use some forecast. Obviously, your forecast is going to be wrong. And obviously, that means there are going to be some penalties for either uh, producing more than what you traded or producing less than what you traded. So that's what these prices are going to reflect. Um, then the price you can sell your energy for at time t, but then there's going to be a price for compensation at time t plus k. So if you produce more than what you uh, traded, uh, the surplus is going to be bought at a price that's lower than the original price pi s. And if you underproduce, you're going to have to buy the energy that's missing at a price that's higher than the price you got in the first place. So you, you, you're kind of penalized, right? But in the market, actually, the penalization is a bit funny. Is uh, You may be penalized only for one direction, not the other. Because if there is not enough energy in the system and you're producing too little, actually, you're helping the system um, implicitly. So you're not going to be penalized. Though if there's too much energy in the system and you're also producing too much, you're one of the reasons why there's a problem. So you're going to be penalized. Right. So it's a bit of a funny situation where the penalization is based on your situation, the overall system situation. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to read more about electricity market, there's lots of source resources you could you could use. You will recognize some very uh, common problem later on uh, based on this setup. So we have a revenue function uh, that is driving all the decision making. And we're saying this revenue function is based on some prices. So you have the day ad price. That's a price you would get when you bid in the market. And then you have these two penalties for when you overproduce and when you underproduce. And as I mentioned, most likely one of these penalties is going to be zero because if you're on the right side, you're not penalized. And if you're on the wrong side, then you're going to be penalized. We have this expression here in the middle uh, bottom for the revenue that express the fact that then we're going to be paid at this direct price pi s for whatever we really produce and then we're going to subtract um, the penalty if you overproduce or if you underproduce and that's why i have these two terms with a little plus on the bottom right it's to take the positive part right so i i separate the two cases so if your production is more than your contract it's the term in the middle pi o omega minus uh, y plus and then if you underproduce, it's the last term on the right. And only one of these two terms is going to be active, obviously, because um, you cannot overproduce and underproduce at the same time. The first term in this revenue function is um, not something you can control. You can see the red variable, the decision variable, only come on the two terms at the very right. 
So actually, in terms of an optimization problem, we don't really care about the first term and we can remove it when we define the loss function that we want to minimize. So the real loss function that we want to minimize here, it's uh, what it looks like. It's at the very bottom. And um, for those who um, remember their material from decision analytics, it's a news vendor problem, uh, which is very common um, in so many application areas. So for now, it's not important, but later on, it will be important that we're dealing uh, with a news vendor problem. So the basic situation I said is that we have no forecast because if I really don't trust my forecast and this I've had this situation with many people I interact with, the way they're going to make decision is to say, OK, I have a forecast. I don't trust it. So I'm going to do as if I don't have a forecast. So that's really the base situation. What decisions would I make if I don't have a forecast? So we, let's call it blind decision making. <laughs> so here we, we have different type of variables and I remove this pi s because I say in my decision making at the end of the day, I don't really care. It's only about this random variable omega. For me, it's how much energy I'm going to produce. And ideally, I would want to have a forecast for that. But let's say now I don't have one. And then I have these penalties for if I overproduce or if I underproduce. So what would I do if I knew nothing about all of these variables? So it's too bad we're not together because that would be a bit more interactive. I'm going to give you the, the solution right away. Uh, I mean, so first, uh, we would need some kind of a prior, some kind of expert uh, input, expert knowledge we bring in into the setup. And if I have no forecast for omega, I would say somehow, you know, if I was scaling my renewable energy production between zero and one, you know, one being equivalent to the nominal capacity, for instance, somehow I have a uniform distribution between zero and one, right? Anything could happen equally. Um, because I have no idea, I have no better information. So I use an uninformative prior on omega and same story for the penalties. If I don't know better, I can just assume they're going to be equal, right? The penalty for overproducing is the same as the penalty for underproducing. But then we, we can show that the robust decision that you can make, which we call minimax regret, uh, it's to beat half. So half is half of the nominal capacity. If you say, for instance, the wind farm that you're trading with in the electricity market is 100 megawatts uh, wind farm, then you would beat 50 megawatts. If you have no information and you want to have a robust approach uh, to decision making. OK, but that's the fully, fully blind setup. What now if we're only blind in one direction? If I know nothing about the random variable omega, but I know something about the penalties and even have perfect information about the penalties. So we can use the same kind of reasoning. Um, for omega, we have an informative prior. So it's still a uniform distribution between zero and one, one being the nominal capacity. And then, as I say, we have perfect knowledge of uh, these two penalties. Um, there we have this uh, solution, which, by the way, sorry, it's a, it's a mistake here. Um, it's not just the minimax regret. It would be also our expected utility solution. It's uh, the solution to the news vendor problem where we account for the asymmetry between the penalties and then our optimal decision. Uh, it's the quantile of this uniform distribution at this uh, critical level, pi O over the sum of the two penalties. So that's, that's the solution I would go for if I know nothing about my renewable energy generation, but I have perfect knowledge about the penalties. And so what if we are penalty blind now? So I have information about my renewable energy generation. So that can be the full distribution. So a predictive CDF or a predictive uh, distribu uh, density, sorry, for omega, or, or maybe just the expectation, right? So I know the conditional expectation of what could be produced given the information I have at time t. But still, I know nothing about the penalties. And then we can show uh, mathematically that the robust decision we can make, which is this minimax regret solution, then it's to beat the expectation. And that's uh, something that we know also from a pragmatic point of view. Uh, most people in electricity markets, that's what they beat. You know, they have a, a forecast, which is a deterministic forecast for renewable energy generation. It's actually the conditional expectation. 
And it works very well because that's one of the best bids they can make in the market if they say, I don't know much about the market penalties. OK, so we have these three cases which are uh, our limiting cases if we have no information at all or if we say we have a little bit of information, which means information for one of the variables, but not for the other variable. Good. So that's our base case. Now let's build on that. There's a case with deterministic forecast, um, but seriously, I have to tell you, this is the least interesting case. Uh, I've been doing that in the classroom with uh, different uh, students, different type of students. And at the end of the day, what you do is that you're going to set up some kind of decision rules. If you don't trust the forecast, you're going to say, OK, I'm going to say what I bid in the market or whatever decision I want to make under uncertainty um, is going to be based on the decision rule where I don't know, I can say I bid alpha times the forecast with alpha between zero and one. And I try to learn it on the sliding window in the past. Um, I can revert to some kind of long term statistics uh, to have some kind of anchor bid if I don't trust the forecast, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So just to say it's very, very pragmatic the way you can make decisions based on deterministic forecast if you do not trust the forecast. I would be happy to discuss it, but I thought since we have only 30, 35 minutes, uh, we should go to the most uh, general uh, case. So the most general case is probabilistic forecast. And why do I want to cover that is because we have a nice framework where we have recognized the news vendor problem already. And if we have probabilistic forecast and a news vendor problem, there's actually quite a lot we can do, but it's going to get a bit technical. So please bear with me. There's going to be a few uh, theorems and stuff on the slides, but I will explain the intuition and make sure that we uh, we understand what's going on without needing to focus on the mass. OK, so the news vendor problem, um, I think most of you have heard about them. Uh, it's a very classical problem in stochastic optimization, which is exactly what we have for renewables in electricity market. Uh, we have a one shot possibility to make our decision so that the bid we place on the market. The outcome is uncertain. We're not really sure of what we're going to produce if we have a wind farm or a solar power plant. We assume in principle that we know marginal profit and loss. So for us, that would be more actually the penalties if we are long or short in the market. So if we overproduce or underproduce. Uh, and the aim is to maximize expected profit. So we have this expected utility maximization problem where we plug our forecast uh, in there. So we know the solution. Um, and it's kind of wrapping up what I said in the first part of the talk um, for a news vendor problem. So for renewables in electricity markets, we have these three types of information as input. Um, it's the predictive CDF for renewable energy generation for each lead time in the future we care about. And there are 24 per day in continental Europe. There are 48 per day here because the time step are half hourly in the market from midnight to midnight. But for each market time unit, so each half hour in the UK electricity market, um, we can use a news vendor uh, setup and decide on the optimal bid based on the predictive CDF, CDF sorry, for renewable energy generation and the penalties for overproducing and underproducing. So if we want to minimize this uh, loss function in expectation, we know that the solution is one of the quantiles of the predictive CDF for renewable energy generation, and the level of the quantile is given by the asymmetry of the penalties. One funny thing that happens already there is that it was in green uh, so far, these penalties, uh, but actually we don't know them, otherwise it wouldn't be fun. So these penalties are also in blue. They are not input parameters that you can just put in as, you know, it's perfect knowledge from uh, the market. It's something that is also a random variable that we would like to predict. So eventually we have to predict renewable energy generation and we have to predict the penalties um, in a quite complex uh, setup. So we replace the penalties by some random variables. And actually, we realize that what we care about is not directly these two random variables for the underage and overage penalty. So the penalty if you overproduce and underproduce is the asymmetry. And the asymmetry is actually something that is between zero and one, right? That's going to give you the optimal uh, quantile level. Um, and then I told you in plus the actual outcome at the end is always 
that you're going to be penalized or not penalized, right? It's going to be in one direction or the other. So at the end of the day, it looks like a simple Bernoulli variable. So the outcome can be zero or one, right? Uh, and then the chance of success of the Bernoulli variable is given by the asymmetry between the penalties. So that's why um, I've proposed a generalization of this news vendor problem, which actually was already proposed uh, 60 something years ago by people in the US, but they didn't write it in this uh, way. Um, but in this generalization, we say everything is uncertain, both the penalties, both the omega, so the uncertain demand or the uncertain production in our case. Uh, and then we have this more general version of a news vendor problem, which we call a Bernoulli uh, news vendor problem. The thing is that we, we have to generalize the, the loss function we work with. We have to generalize the stochastic optimization problem we work with. But under very mild condition, we actually retrieve the solution of the original uh, news vendor problem, uh, which is uh, here you have it at the bottom, that the optimal decision we can make is based on the forecast we have for the uncertain uh, energy production. Uh, There's supposed to be a hat um, if, if we want to have it as a predictive CDF here, you would have a hat on top of the of the F omega uh, at the bottom. Sorry for that. So the optimal decision of the Bernoulli news vendor problem is this optimal quantile as in the classical news vendor problem uh, that we know of. Good. But why why did I want to do that? Remember, we want to say we do not trust the forecast. OK, so now there are two different ways not to trust the forecast because we have two types of forecasts. And that's why in the no forecast case, I was telling you the two base case we care about is if we can say something about energy, but we cannot say anything about the prices and the penalties, or if we can say something about the prices and penalties, but nothing about the renewable energy generation. So that's really the two cases we're going to be interested in now. So that's our problem setup. You can see here, as of today, you have many academics and commercial vendors. They provide a forecast, probabilistic forecast, for these two variables. One of the variables is the renewable energy generation, which can be scaled between zero and one, so zero and the nominal capacity of the wind farm. This is an example on the left. It is forecast that are issued by me, but uh, many other people issue probabilistic forecasts for energy generation these days. And on the right, these are uh, probabilistic forecasts for market quantities. These are not directly forecasts from a Bernoulli variable, but from all the forecasts you can have today out there, you can deduce the probabilistic forecast for this Bernoulli variable S. OK, so we have these two forecasts. So now I can choose not to trust the forecast I have on the left or not to trust the forecast I have on the right, or both actually eventually, but it's not something I've looked at, um, funnily enough. But we'll discuss that maybe at the end why it's uh, it's not been done. So let's say we do not trust the forecast, and that's, sorry, that's where it gets a bit technical in the way it's written, but the story I'm going to tell you is not going to be technical, you're going to see. So we, we have what we call ambiguity about the predictive CDF for renewable power generation. So we have a forecast for renewable power generation, but we think this forecast is not the best we could get, right? So what we're going to say, and that's been proposed by different people doing some stochastic optimization, we're going to say that I was given a forecast, which is not perfect. So actually the best forecast I could have gotten as input for my decision problem is slightly away from the forecast I was given. Right. So think of it. You have a forecast, a predictive CDF. And I say, OK, I know that the best predictive CDF I could get is not exactly the one I was given, but it's not very far. It, it, it's just a bit different. And then we bring this idea of distributionally robust optimization to say, but if I could think of all the distributions that are close to the one I was given, I'm going to try <coughs> to find the worst case. And then I'm going to minimize my expected cost, my expected loss for this worst case. And then if I can do that for the worst case, that means that for all potential distributions that are around the one I was given, then I'm good. I have some kind of guarantee I've controlled what will happen with the worst case. OK, but so now we have to define what are these distributions around the one I was given. 
And there, that's a nice idea that was proposed by someone else. Actually, it's not been proposed by me. Um, two, uh, three authors from Singapore said, you know, look at the plot here on the right. The black curve is the predictive CDF that may be provided with for a given lead time in the future. And then around this black curve, we're going to draw these envelopes. And these envelopes are saying, I think the best predictive density or predictive CDF here, sorry, uh, I could use as input to decision making is anywhere within this envelope, right? And you see here two types of envelope. One is in blue, one is in green. It's just you control the size of the area around or the ball, they call it a ball, around the predictive CDF you were provided with. And if you have this envelope to be very small, somehow you say, I trust my forecast a lot. So I believe the best distribution is very close. But if you take the green one, for instance, here, you don't trust much your forecast. You say, actually, I think the best predictive CDF I could use could be very far from what I'm given. OK. So the first piece of work is to define this kind of ball around the predictive CDF you're provided with. And so here in this paper, you can ask me for the paper, by the way, I'm happy to share it. Um, I've been proposing expressions for how you can uh, define this, this, this ball around the predictive CDF you're provided with. Eventually, you have two worst cases. If you look, for instance, at the green one here, you see there's one that's above and one that's below. Or you can look at it as one on the left and one on the right. And these are really the two worst cases where you're the most far off compared to the predictive CDF you were given, which is the black one. OK, I hope you agree with me. <laughs> That's the worst case uh, that could happen to you in terms of being off. And then that's the, the nice thing that these guys, Fu et al, they, they describe in their paper. It's actually not published. It's a print print that's available online. I think they still haven't managed to publish it. Um, but I've looked at their work and I verified their proof, etc. So I agree with the result uh, that they cover. You, you recognize here this envelope. In black, you have the, the predictive CDF that's provided. In blue, you have this envelope, similar to what I shown in the previous slide. And then you have this green line horizontally. It, it starts from the left at alpha equal the optimal quantile of the traditional news vendor problem. So if I don't trust the predictive CDF for wind power generation or renewable energy generation, but I trust the penalty information that I have, somehow I know the critical level, the critical quantile I care about, and that is green line. What I don't trust is the predictive CDF for renewable power generation, but we know it's within this envelope in blue. So what Fu et al. they said, you know, they say actually from here, we can deduce analytically what would be my best decision, knowing that I accept that the distribution, the predictive CDF can be anywhere within this envelope. And the solution is like this. They say, you know, if you look at the worst case on the left and on the right or above and below, actually we take the cut. So I don't know, I have a pointer here. Do I get a pointer? Well, I cannot find a pointer. So look at where the green line cut the blue envelope. There's two points on the left and on the right. And that's where you have these two lines going down to the X axis. So the result of Fu et al is to say, OK, I need to find these two points. And then depending on the optimal quantile that I'm looking at, the optimal decision to make is some kind of weighted average of these two points where the green line cross the blue uh, envelope. And that's quite neat as a result. Um, first, because it really works. <laughs> it's very nice to see that when you don't trust the forecast, you have a simple analytical expression uh, to find what's your best decision then. And you can really show both uh, theoretically and empirically that was the best decision to make. And also, if you were to say, well, you know, if I really don't trust the forecast, I could make this envelope as wide as possible uh, and eventually going to the case where, you know, you can say nothing about omega, and that would be this uh, uniform uh, zero one case that I discussed in the case of no forecast. And you see the corollary here at the bottom. Actually, we retrieve this information that I told you when we discussed the no forecast case. If you really do not trust the forecast to the point you say it's like not using it, you would find the same solution 
as we discussed in the case you have no forecast at all. So that means it's consistent. This kind of decision making framework generalizes what you would do from trusting the forecast fully to degrading that slowly and slowly and slowly by changing this radius of the envelope to go into the case where, you know, you say, I do not trust the forecast and somehow I do decision making without the forecast for renewable energy generation as input. So that's a very nice case, but it's only for uh, Omega, right? The renewable power generation. What if now I do not trust the forecast for the market penalties? I have these two market penalties I need to predict for. I can tell you, if you can produce very nice forecasts for that in the market, you're going to become very rich. And traders are going to give you, energy traders are going to give you uh, very nice jobs because it's very, very difficult to predict uh, in the market what these penalties are about. So I've generalized that to dealing with this variable S, which is a Bernoulli variable. And I want to predict probabilistically uh, the characteristics of S. But that means only predicting the chance of success uh, for S. It is uh, tau, right? So we make a forecast for that. But then we say we don't trust the forecast. So it's the same idea. If we don't trust the forecast, we're going to allow to have some kind of interval around this predicted chance of success tau. And we say the true one or the best one for me to make decision is anywhere within this interval around the forecast I was given. And, and for Bernoulli variable, it's actually very easy. I mean, it's the easiest random variable you can deal with, really. This uh, interval is literally an interval. You know, you can say then tau can be anywhere between the tau hat I was given, that's the forecast, and tau hat minus epsilon and tau hat plus epsilon, right? So you have this interval of size two epsilon around the forecast you were given originally for the chance of success. So there some low level technicality to consider. Obviously, the interval should be uh, within zero one uh, because you cannot have a chance of success below zero and above one. Right. So you may need to clip this interval. And here I propose at the bottom another way to define this ambiguity set where we also account for the asymmetry. As you get closer to one bound, for instance, you may not want this interval to be centered on the toe hat. It can be, you know, closer on the side that goes to the bound and wider on the side that goes toward the, the middle, right? It, it's not very important. It's just different ways to, to define it. And so then we need to find the solution, right? It's great to define the problem saying, I don't trust my forecast for my Bernoulli variable. I trust my forecast for the renewable energy generation though, my omega. Um, and then the intuition for the result is here. We have three points we care about for the chance of success. It's the one that was predicted and given to us. It's tau hat. And then it's the two bounds of the intervals that in principle are our worst case scenarios, right? It's the most far off you could be. And here we are looking in this three plot at the expected loss for the news vendor problem as a function of the decision Y that's on the X axis for these three different value of tau. So the tau that was predicted and the two worst cases, the bounds above and below. So that's why you have three colors for three curves in each of these plots. It is just a simple Monte Carlo simulation here just to illustrate the intuition. The worst case all over these plots is the curve that is the highest. So if you look, for instance, at the one on the very, or in the middle, we're gonna start with the middle. You can see you have this green curve, you have this blue curve, and you have this black curve. The worst one is the one that is above the others. So you can see here, for instance, if you're below y equals 0 0.25, the worst case is the green curve. But if you're above y equals 0 0.25, the worst case is the black curve. Okay? And that's the optimization we try to do. We define the worst case, and then we want to find the minimum for this combination of worst cases. So here the minimum is quite simple, is actually exactly at y equals 0 0.25. It's where these two black and uh, green curve cross. On the right side, for instance, it's a bit different. We can see that the worst case on the left is the green curve. The worst case on the right is the black curve. But the minimum, the minimum point when you combine these two curves is actually on the black curve at around 0 0.3 or something like that, right? Um, 
it's the, the minimum we have for the curve uh, in black, okay? And then we have the opposite situation for the case on the very left, uh, just symmetric. The value of 0.25 is quite interesting because it's the expectation of omega, and that's going to be important for the, the result that we have afterwards. But we have two, three cases here. You can see in the middle, we have these two curve worst case scenarios that cross exactly at the expectation of omega. But then the minimum for these two curves, the black and the green, they are on both sides of expectation of omega. On the left, the minimum for these two curves are both on the left of expectation of omega. And in the right, you can see that the minimum for the black and the green curve are both on the right of expectation of omega. So that's how we can make this split between the three cases and define which are the optima for these three subcases. So that gives us a very ugly result here, even though it's extremely simple to implement. You know, it's uh, one line of code. If uh, this, I do this. Oh, sorry, it's, it's a few lines if you separate the if and else if. Uh, but still, what we're going to do is that we have to separate these cases for what happened for the worst cases potentially of the chance of success tau. And then for each of the subcases for where the minima for these curves are located, we figure out uh, which one is our best solution. So this, this is proven in the paper. Uh, and then again, we have a nice uh, limiting result because I told you if you have no forecast for these penalties, the best we could do is to beat the expectation of omega. And here it's the same. You see that as you increase the size of this interval for the chance of success, we eventually asymptotically go to the case of no forecast for the penalties, and we retrieve the fact that the best bid we can make is this expectation of omega. So that's perfect. Good. So I have some simulation case studies. What I'm going to do, and I'm going to skip directly to the main results. Let's trade for real. Um, we use the portfolio of French wind farms in the paper I wrote. Um, we did it for some other case studies, but that's the only one I could uh, publish. I could use the data for and publish. Um, what we've been doing is we've been comparing the classical news vendor problem approach and the approach with uh, this view of I don't trust the forecast either for the renewable power generation or for the penalties. And then on the right, what you see as this curve is over a period of 600 days, um, what you see as delta regret somehow, it's how much more money I make by using this kind of approaches of not trusting forecasts compared to the approach where you would trust the forecast and just directly use the news vendor problem. So you see here, eventually, over the, the 600 days, we reach around, I don't know, 500 euros more per megawatt hour produce of revenue we can get from this uh, quite large uh, wind farm. Um, but what's most important is that it's just positive, right? So you always will have increased revenue by actually accepting that you shouldn't trust the forecast. And also what's interesting is that here all the curves follow uh, each other. So that means that you can get equally better outcomes by saying that you do not trust one or the other of the forecast you used as input, either the forecast for renewable power generation or the forecast for uh, the penalties in the market. So naturally you think, okay, the best would be to combine uh, both, right? The problem we have there, mathematically, it becomes much more complicated. <laughs> so, so far it's not been done by anyone. It's a uh, future work for everybody. All right, but now some concluding uh, thoughts. Um, the main message I wanted to convey um, I don't think the, all the technical aspects I think are nice, but they are not the most important. If you have some news vendor problems to deal with, I would actually invite you to think of it, that you can use these very simple analytical expressions, because at the end of the day, if you understand the intuition, it is very simple. Um, and you can make better decisions by saying, what if I don't trust the forecast? The thing is that it's one aspect of forecast quality we normally don't think of because forecast quality is really, is the forecast good or not, right? But eventually for me, it's also an aspect of forecast quality connecting to forecast value to say, you know, can I trust my forecast or not? Or should I trust my forecast or not? 
This is especially true for probabilistic forecasts because obviously with a single probabilistic forecast, you never know if this forecast is going to be good or not. So, so I think it's very nice to explore other aspects of forecast quality that are related to trust. Um, but then, yeah, here the thing is that instead of doing it based on judgment, I think it's great to do it based on judgment. There are people who are very good to find ways to deal with lack of trust in forecasts, but here it's done in a purely data-driven manner, which is also quite nice. So directly in this framework for decision-making, we can embed this idea that we do not trust the forecast, and already based on the data, we correct our decision-making to be more robust towards the fact we're not sure we can trust the forecast. So I hope I convinced you, and uh, any question is welcome. Thank you very much. Hi, Pierre. Uh, thanks a lot. That was uh, in quite interesting. Yes, thanks. Uh, <laughs> so now we can move to the Q&A session. So what I would uh, ask, people can type their questions in the chat, and I see that there is a couple already there. Oh. Uh, or if you want, you just raise your hand, and I will give you the power of asking the question uh, using your voice. Just keep in mind that this, uh, uh, this is recorded, and we will upload that on YouTube, so everyone will see what you ask. Um, mm -hmm. I see, you, Valeria, you have your hands up. Uh, wait a second, I'll find a way to give you the camera and microphone. And you've asked the question in chat, maybe you can actually. Yeah, so, and you Pierre, want... Pierre, you can Did stop, stop sharing. sharing or... yeah. yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, go ahead. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear yes. Me? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you very much. It was a uh, quite interesting presentation. Uh, so my question is, you know, it's obviously all these points hold true, right? You know, we cannot uh, trust the forecast. My question is more like on the technical side, you know, yeah. like bands, right? When we kind of draw these bands, uh, how how do we uh, kind of correlate them with uh, what is going to happen re in reality, right? You know, you have these uh, bands on both sides, you know, how are these bands defined? And you know yep. how can we make sure they really the safe uh, bands, right? Yeah. Uh, and related. So that's to, a very good question. Yeah. 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 And related to that, uh, you know, um, I think there is like uh, quite a few assumptions, right? In this approach, there is beta distribution. There is Monte Carlo, which is uh, is kind of does not have uh, probabilistic guarantees, right? So uh, you know, the question is, how can we expect? If you are kind of yep. sampling from the data that we truly kind of go for what we expect in terms of confidence, right? So yep. because, you know, things like Monte Carlo do not have guarantees, and if you are kind of specifying ninety percent, in reality it's going to be uh, you know much much lower, presumably, right? Yeah. So the the only time I mentioned Monte Carlo was for this example to show the intuition, right? So here there's no Monte Carlo in the the method itself. Um, it, it's actually one of the nice aspects of uh, distributionally robust optimization pushed forward by people from the stochastic optimization literature is that in principle you can derive guarantees on out of sample performance um, because it, it has its min max regrets and then depending on situation you know they are the ideal case where you have stationarity so it's easier to say things to other, other case where it's not stationary but you can still say something about your guarantees um, so so it's actually I, I do not talk about guarantees here but if you pull the literature on this uh, distribution robust optimization um, there is a lot about these guarantees that you can get. So that's why I think this kind of framework is very nice to connect the forecasting and, and the decision making. Oh, but, but, but I think you, you were also saying about this interval. So there I agree with you. Um, one of the approach that is used, including by me here in this paper, is to do it in a purely data driven manner. So you do cross validation and you try to find empirically what is the optimal uh, envelope, if you want, around your distribution, so that you account for how it may deviate. You could say we could use expert knowledge also. Some people may say from experience, we know how bad it may be. Mm -hmm. I think it's very risky. Um, but, but yeah, j just to go back to my point, though, if you use the framework from distribution robust optimization, you can derive guarantees for that. Sure, but how how would it compare to other approaches? For example, 
using conformal prediction, one can produce conformal predictive distribution, which does have guarantees, and we know it's going to be... Yeah, but so here, this is what we have as input. The distribution can come from conformal approaches if you want, right? I, I showed in my talk, maybe I should share again, I, I showed in my talk um, some distribution for wind power generation, for instance, right? So this one's on the left. Uh, actually, they come from something that is very close to conformal prediction. Uh, uh -huh. In this case, in this example, still, even though you have something that comes from conformal prediction, the guarantee you have is in terms of probabilistic calibration, for instance. Right? Yeah. But uh -huh. it, it doesn't mean that's the best, very best distribution you could have right now as input to decision making. It's it's a guarantee in terms of calibration probabilistically, right? That makes so, sense. Yeah. yeah so, so here, yeah, just to say, that's why I meant it's another angle of uh, forecast quality and connection to value that we have. And even if we have very good guarantees in terms of calibration, it doesn't mean it's still the best distribution we could have used for input to decision making. All makes so, sense. Th so much. Is thanks perfect. for the good question. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Valerie, and thanks, uh, Pierre, for answering. Do we have any other questions? Uh... I, I, frankly speaking, I probably didn't understand uh, some aspects of, of your okay. talk. So I, I, I feel a bit confused about the idea that one of these penalties can be zero, for example. Mm. And as a result, uh, the solution would be to produce 100% quantile or something like that, which is so weird. This comes more for the, from the basic uh, problem, right? Mm -hmm. The energy market participation problem. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you're right. So w one of the answer you would have from these people in the electricity market um, or the regulation part of that, they say, but you would never be able to predict this. I told mm -hmm. you it's so difficult to predict this penalty. So think of it in terms of expectations. Like, you know, when mm -hmm. you think of inflation and try to predict for inflation, you say, well, it's a lot about expectations. So here it's a bit of the same, even though eventually only one of the penalty will be realized and exist, the other one will be zero. Mm -hmm. In terms of expectations, players in the market can never really expect that one penalty is zero. It's impossible to predict mm -hmm. that. So, mm -hmm. so that's why you, in terms of the decision-making problem, you never have these penalties really going to zero. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say it's a Bernoulli viable because you always have your expectation for a certain mm -hmm. asymmetry, but at the end of the day, zero or one will, uh, will realize. Oh, interesting. Uh, you also That's a fun problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you also mentioned so just to go, so that I understand that. But you also mentioned that uh, I don't remember which one is it. Uh, yeah, underage uh, yeah. probably is not penalized, while overage is uh, more. Yes. it's the asymmetry, right? Can it yeah. be that both of them are not penalized in some situations, or either of them is not penalized? So the. the all, all cases are possible in principle. Okay. So th think of it, it's like, um, I don't know, let's say like with a reservoir management, right? If you have a reservoir and you have a lot of people pouring water in the reservoir and you have a target level, mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, someone may come to the reservoir and say, oh my God, guys, you know, the water has spilled over because you've put too much water. If you want to point fingers, you will point at the finger of those who put water, more and more water in, right? And say, it's your fault. Right. Mm -hmm. So so it's a bit of the same here. Mm -hmm. You have to look at the overall situation in the energy system, the individual situation of the market players, and then you compare. So if there's too much energy in the system and you, you've been producing less than what you should have produced, they say actually implicitly you've helped us because you, you reduce the stress on the system by producing less than what you should. So, mm -hmm. so that's why they are not uh, penalized. Well, if you're one of the guys who are producing more than what you should, you're actually one of the reasons why we have a problem now, right? Mm -hmm. but, but then there are many other kind of subcases because you may have some people who cancel each other. So let's say you have a wind farm, I have a wind farm. I produce more than what I should. You produce less than what you should. Mm -hmm. All in all, maybe it's zero, the balance. So the system yeah. operator say, well, for us, there's no problem because it's in balance. And then we won't penalize you both because, okay, you made a mm -hmm. mistake, but at the end of the day, it's no big deal. Right. So okay. we have to be a bit careful that it's, it can be very complex, all the subcases uh, that they are there. OK, well, thanks. Um, there are several people who have been asking in the comments for the paper or the slide. Oh, yeah, yeah. 
can share, I will share the paper. Maybe you can do that over the LinkedIn and we can then uh, repost so that other people can take it from there. So yeah. we'll do that after the presentation. Uh, yeah. Well, while we still don't have any other questions, I'll ask another one <laughs> using <laughs> this opportunity. Um, you also work in other areas, not, not only energy, right? You did some work yeah. with the NHS, for example. So do you see any other um, use cases for the, the similar uh, approaches that you've discussed here in other areas and other domains? Yeah, so actually, you know, this use vendor problems are everywhere. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So here, I mean, we did it for energy because of the funding we got. And also a lot of the work I do is with energy and, and people tend to be interested because these energy traders, you know, there's so much money at stake. So if you can improve a little bit on this method, they can have huge benefits. Right. Mm -hmm. So so that's why these are good case studies. But, but though in practice, I think, um, I mean, if you think of inventory management, supply yeah, yeah. chains, uh, uh, I mean, there are news vendor problems everywhere. So mm -hmm. here, that's why I wanted the talk to be quite generic, even though I use this um, application for illustration. All this method and these new ways to make decision by saying I do not trust the forecast, they can be used for any news vendor problem. So we could make a list, you know, if we see some for procurement for the NHS, for uh, supply chain management or or shipping container management for Maersk or whatever, mm -hmm. uh, then then we can uh, we can use it. Um, but uh, I have to say here I've not it yeah I've not done it myself. Yeah. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, Le yeah, Leonidas mentioned inventory control. Yeah, it's clear. It's clear. Yes, yeah, the problem. The lead time is yet another random variable. Yeah. Yeah, That's but it's cool. cool. I mean, <laughs> if we have to generalize even more the setup and find a solution to it, it's uh, yet another challenge, right? So it's good. Yeah, I like how you uh, <laughs> consider the challenges as uh, <laughs> as a plus side rather than the negative side. Uh, yeah, Leo says that do it and uh, they will use it. Right. Uh, we still have some time. I don't want to continue just a discussion for the sake of discussion. So if anyone has questions, please ask. Otherwise, I'll start talking about random things or relatively random <laughs> ones. <laughs> So, for example, okay, from news, news vendor perspective, maybe you have views. It's sort of related, but not directly. That uh, we found with colleagues that uh, in many cases, when you produce quantiles from using this classical formula for news, news vendor, it tends to uh, underestimate the uncertainty and you sort of order, uh, if I remember correctly, order le less than you need to. Uh, I don't know whether that holds for energy uh, market yeah, cases. But that's, I mean, that links to the question that uh, Valérie was asking uh, before. Uh -huh. Because when we assess the forecast quality of our predictive densities, we cannot say we have the perfect forecast, right? We can say it's probabilistically yeah, yeah. calibrated, it's maybe sharper or it has good skill or whatever. Mm -hmm. But when we make a given decision and we say it is the optimal quantile, we have to assume that the quantiles are correct. Mm -hmm. The problem is often that you think you beat the quantile, I don't know, 0.67 because it's your optimal asymmetry. But since your distribution realistically is not the perfect distribution to, de to describe what's going on, actually, it's not truly this quantile that you're using mm -hmm. as a decision. So after, I think it depends on the kind of problem, the asymmetry of the distributions and how it impacts the true forecast quality. But I wouldn't be surprised that it brings this kind of asymmetry um, that you mentioned, right? That you feel you're a bit below or a bit above. For, for energy, the thing is that it's it's bounded variables. You're between mm -hmm. zero and one. And the density asymmetry change. Because if you predict high level, the asymmetry is on one side. If you predict low level, the asymmetry is in the other side. So I think it tends to compensate each other. Mm -hmm. but, but in a case where... For instance, I don't know, if you predict demand and you manage an inventory, maybe your distribution are always uh, right skewed, right? So the mm. asymmetry is always the same. But And, and you maybe never have the correct, correct distribution. Um, so then I think you may have some kind of systematic uh, error. This framework is also made for that. Mm -hmm. The first formula I was mentioning, where you say, I do not trust my forecast for the uncertain parameter omega, mm -hmm. should actually try to compensate for this uh, aspect so mm -hmm. you could try i mean we could try it in general yeah, yeah okay 
Right. Well, I'll continue my <laughs> interrogation. So, uh, when when you say that we don't <coughs> we, trust, we don't trust, do you sort of consider it as a, a binary, or is there a proportion? You know, I trust it by ten percent, things like that. Yeah. Can it be? So, so that's the point of these parameters that control the envelopes. In principle, it's a way to tune your level of trust in the forecast. And I was saying, if if you get this parameter to their maximum value, it should end up being, you know, I don't trust the forecast at all. So mm -hmm. I behave as if I was not using the forecast. Well, if you get it to zero, it's I fully trust the forecast. So I take them at face value. Mm, yeah. Right? Okay. So in principle, this parameter is doing exactly what you say. Okay, yeah. It is doing this fine tuning between um, fully trusting and not trusting at all. Yeah, okay. Um, great, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I don't have any more questions, I think. <laughs> Otherwise <laughs> we'll good. meet in person and I'll ask more. Sure, but also, yeah, yeah, I'll be happy to come to Lancaster and cover some other topics uh, when being there. But yeah. but yeah, I, I hope our friends in Lancaster also will do some more work connecting uh, forecasting and decision making. I think it's always cool to um, to see yeah. how we can do better with forecasting by understanding how people make decisions. And I'm sure you already do a lot, right? But uh, it's always good to do some more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Pierre. No problem. Uh, so thanks everyone for attending and uh, this was the last webinar in this uh, season and we'll be back in the season 24-25. So see you all there. Thank you for your questions and thanks for attending. See you all. Talk to you soon. Bye -bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye.